What's up, everybody? My name is Unrested. I am the lead host here at Psycho Delph. You Psycho Derps are here because you want a cocktail of the creepy, freaky, fucked up shit. And you know what? You've come to the right place. Give your morals a day off. Welcome to the world that your parents warned you about. This is motherfucking Psycho Delph! So, since it is our first episode of Psychodump, I think an explanation is in order. And so, the word Psychodump, let's break it down piece by piece. Psycho is our first one, and this is pretty much a Romanji spelling of the Japanese word Psycho, which is usually written in katakana. It is a word which means the best or the greatest, and that's kind of what we're going for. We're looking for the best or the greatest information. What is our information? Well, phonetically, Psycho is pronounced like the word Psycho in English, so we're looking for the most psychotic, fucked up, weird shit. The best of it. Now, dump is our next word. What does dump mean? Well, dump means shit. It also means info. So we're looking for the shit, the info, everything that we can deliver to you and give you the world your parents warned you about. This is more based upon a personal experience. The Hell Elk is a thing, monster, demon, spirit, fuck it if I know, that lives in the fucking forest of Oland which is a small group of islands between Sweden and Finland. It seems to stick into the forest and usually comes out on gloomy, foggy days. Well, that, my friends, are the hell elk. Now, the thing about this thing is that it doesn't appear in tape or photos, or video, you know, anything, so it can't be proved. Only through people's own experience, it can be proved. This thing has no features that can be worth mentioning, besides it's long, dark, and black. And it has elk horns, but no other features can be seen on it. It will appear as if it's just a mere shadow. The worst part is that whenever you go into the forest during any night, it will appear. You might not see it until you stare. But if you watch too long, however, you're lost. You see, if you stare too long, it will appear right in front of your face, and all you will see are big, bloody red eyes on an emotionless, dark face with no features at all. Just a dark, plain face. And just like that, you disappear. You heard me. You just disappear into nowhere, forever getting tortured by its gaze in emotionless pits of hell. Even worse is that if you don't look too long, if you just merely watch it from a distance, it will stalk you. Even worse is that, if you see it, but it doesn't look too long, it will stalk you. Now this may sound pretty slender manish, but you won't exactly get that feeling. That static noise and thing, no. Just a huge paranoia of it following you, grieving you, 
haunting you forever. When you go to bed, you can see it at the edge of your bed, standing there, waiting for you to look for too long. When you look out your window into the forest, it will be just at the closest tree, staring at you, waiting for you. Waiting for you to fall for its gaze. المغربية يقصده مئات يوميا طلبا للفصل في قضايا عالقة أطرافها إنس متعب وجني رفض الخروج من جسده إلا بتدخل أعلى هيئة للجن أو لطلب العلاج من مرض عجز الاختصاص أو أهل الاختصاص عن تحديد المتابعة إمليل أول محطاتنا في طريقنا إلى حيث يوجد شمهروش ملك الجن في الموروث الشعبي المغربي وآخر عهدنا بوسائل النقل الحديثة وليس أمامنا إلا طريقة واحدة للوصول إلى غايتنا تضاعف عدد فريقنا بعد الاستعانة بثلاثة بغال مشرقة تسلمت دفة القيادة لكونها أدرى بشعاب الجبال منا ها نحن نطوي الأرض في الطريق هنالك قادمون وذاهبون أما الوجهة والمقصد فهو شمهروش أو شمهورش وصلنا قبة غير نظامية تحيطها جبال موحشة تضم بين جنبات صخورها أسرابا من الغربان المسكونة بالأرواح بحسب ما يعتقد القائمون على المكان نحن نجلس في محكمة الجن أعلى سلطة للجن بحسب الموروث الشعبي المغربي تتقدم هذه السلطة سيد شمهروش الذي هو بمثابة ملك الجن إلى جواره عدد من المقامات لأسماء جن آخرين سيدي ميمون باشا حمو للعيشة إلى آخره استقبلنا الحاج ابراهيم الحارس الشخصي لشمهروش وحاجب المحكمه العليا للجن ودخلنا الى بلاط شمهروش قصه شمهروش انه هو ليس بانس وهو رجال وهذا مقام كان يعبد فيه لا اقل ولا اقل ولحسن الحظ فان هنالك محكمه ستحدث امراه في نهايه عقدها الرابع من الانس تقاضي جنا من دوله افريقيه احتل جسدها ظلما وبهتانا لذا على المتضرر اللجوء الى القضاء فتقول الاسطوره عندما لا تفيد الطقوس الاحتفاليه ولا القرابين المقدمه في تهدئه الجان واخراجه من مساكنه الادميه ينصح المريض باللجوء الى محكمه الجن الكبرى انا تيقولوا لي بان عندك السودانيين يعني هذاك الشيء ديال الجن قناوه كله جميع الانواع السود الكل يؤكد هنا اننا في بلاط ملك الجن وفي زوايا المكان يزعم الناس ان هنالك المزيد من مقامات الجن مقامات تتوارى بين الصخور اصطحبنا الحاج العربي الى بلاط ابنة السلطان للعيشة صخرتان عملاقتان وشلال ماء صغير وشموع توقد وتموت رفقة الامل في بلاطها 
باش حتى واحد التسجيل ما كيتعدى على الكيس المحكمه كتكون باينه كيكون عدنا ادراجنا وتسلمت البغال مره اخرى زمام الامور اما حصيلتنا من المشاهدات فتختصرها العبارات التاليه عالم اسطوري تحيطه روايات شفويه لا مكان للمنطق فيه عدنا منه مثل ما قصدنا بعلامات استفهام تفرق بعضها ويقين بانه لا ضار ولا نافع الا بامر الله جل في علاه لبرنامج ام بي سي في اسبوع محمد العرب من عمق سلسله جبال الاطلس الكبير Happy Halloween guys, Rich Apocalypse here, and welcome to Psycho Dubs. Hope you guys enjoy what I've got in store for you. Alright guys, pull out your buckets, cause I'm gonna spoon feed the shit out of you with some hype till you barf with Routine. Routine is a first person horror exploration game developed by Lunar Studios. Routine is set on an abandoned moon base. Your job is to find enough data to uncover the truth behind the strange disappearance of everyone stationed on the Lunar Research Station. Now, this game is going to feature a non-linear experience that lets you explore any part of the fully open moon base to find out its secrets. You're going to be immersed with full body awareness, dead zone aiming, and there's going to be no heads up display system, which means no health bars or point systems. You need to run hide and survive the best you can against what's lurking in the dark. There are no health packs, multiple lives. In routine, it has a permadeath system in place. So once you die in the game, you lose that save file, which means you lose all the progress you made. Now what makes this game particularly scary is that permadeath system. You're going to lose everything. And on top of that, you also don't know what's lying around in the dark. It's going to be pretty scary. Just walking around in this abandoned moon base, and then out of nowhere, something comes right up out of the dark and starts to choke the living life out of you. Now, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, that that's actually in the game. Who knows if something's going to come out of the dark and choke every living shit out of you, right? There is something in the dark, but we don't know what. So check out this game, stop by their page, the link should be in, this, in the description box below, and show them some love. Let's help them get this project finished so they can scare the ever-living shit out of us. Next up is Amnesia, a machine for pigs. Unlike the previous games, a machine for pigs was developed by the Chinese group. This game is an indirect sequel to The Dark Descent. The game features several interlocking storylines. Some take place in the past, some in the present, and some are overly real while others may be imagined. The game is a survival horror game played from the first person perspective. Some elements from The Dark Descent have been removed while new elements have been added provide a fresh gameplay experience to veteran players of the Dark Descent. The inventory has been removed along with the oil and tinder boxes. Most of the puzzles that occur are based on physically interacting with the environment. The sanity mechanic of the first game has also been removed, meaning that the darkness and looking at creatures no longer cause any drawbacks. Health regenerates whenever a player is damaged after a certain period of time. AI was also adjusted to ensure players are unable to predict enemy behavior based on their previous experiences with the original game. However, the core of the original game remains. So as not to disappoint fans who want more of what they loved in the original. Now, this game is horrifying. You'll be walking down a corridor one minute and you'll be hearing these creatures squealing onto your tail the next, and you know you gotta put that lantern away and hide. Otherwise, you are dead. Just like pigs that are hanging all, all around you. 
off those dangling meat hooks, calling, beckoning, screaming out your name. The game is available on Steam. Check it out. The date is June 7th, 1995. The time is 1.15 a.m. You arrive home after a year abroad. You expect your family to greet you, but the house is empty. Something's not right. Where is everyone? And what happened here? Unravel the mystery for yourself in Gone Home, a story exploration game from the Fulbright Company. The Fulbright Company is consisted of veterans of the Bioshock series. Now, Gone Home is an interactive exploration simulator. You can open up any door, you can open up any cabinet, and investigate every object to discover clues. And it's not a horror game, so to speak, but the atmosphere itself is creepy, which is why I put this one last on here. Because it's very much worth playing, it's worth checking out. The atmosphere is really creepy, and the background on this house is just as creepy as the environment. I could definitely say you should really, really check out Gone Home. Maybe watch a couple of walkthroughs, and if you like it, you know, if this is kind of your thing, go for it. There's no puzzles, no combat. Well, I mean, you know, they say no puzzles, but I would consider a couple things in here to be puzzles. But check it out. I will put the link to their website down below in the description box. So definitely check this out. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that little list I put together in order, routine. Amnesia Machine for Pigs and Gone Home. Now, Routine is currently in development. It's really creepy so far what they've got. So head over there, show them how hyped up you are for that, and definitely get them motivated to finishing this thing on time, right? Second one, Amnesia Machine for Pigs, already out. Check it out. Got some creepy stuff in it. Third one, Gone Home. Not really, not a horror game, but the environment is creepy enough to just get the hairs on the back of your neck tingling and standing on edge. All right, have any recommendations? Definitely put it in the comment box below or send a message because I would love to check that out. So, enjoy the rest of your psycho dump and enjoy your Halloween. Have a safe one. The city of Alexandria in Egypt witnessed just a few months ago a shocking crime. A father had buried his own three-year-old son in the apartment he lived in with his two other children. The man had lost all compassion and parental emotions when he divorced his wife and prevented her from visiting her own child. The investigation revealed that the two remaining sons were regularly tortured. Then one day, when the father was not home, the neighbors freed them from the hell they were living in. They took them to their mother after the kids had told them what the father had done and the torture that he had put upon them. When the father knew what had happened, he made a report to the police about the abduction of his child. The father said in his confession, I don't know why I was doing it, but it was my pleasure to see the tears of my children, and I enjoyed their screaming while they cried. I did not mean to kill any of them, but one of them died recently between my hands. So, I tried to bury him under the floor of the bathroom. After days, the smell appeared, so I took him out of the grave and put his body on the balcony until he turned into a skeleton and then he was buried again. Hello Psycho Derps, this is Crypto, and tonight let's talk a little bit about the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is a cryptid or legendary creature. Its common description is that of a kangaroo-like creature with the head of a goat, leathery bat-like wings, horns, small arms with clawed hands, cloven hooves, and a forked tail. It has been reported to move quickly and often is described as emitting a blood-curdling scream. 
Its origins date back at least 300 years, but the most widely accepted tale is as follows. It was said that Mother Leeds had 12 children, and after finding she was pregnant for the 13th time, stated that this one would be the devil. In 1735, Mother Leeds was in labor on a stormy night. Gathered around her were her friends. Mother Leeds was supposedly a witch, and the child's father was the devil himself. The child was born normal, but then changed form. It changed from a normal baby to a creature with hooves, a goat's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. It growled and screamed and then killed the midwife before flying up the chimney. It circled the villages and headed toward the pines. In 1740, a clergy exorcised the demon for 100 years and it wasn't seen again until 1890. Throughout the past 200 years or so, there have been both periods of peaceful quiet and periods of sighting mayhem. Generally, the sightings involved the carcasses of some farm animal or animals who were unlucky enough to be in the cryptid's way. At times of increased sightings, many hundreds of people were reported to have seen the beast many times in one night as it sneaked around their neighborhood. In summation, the sightings could be categorized as pre-1909, January 16th to the 23rd, 1909, and post-1909. The grouping of sightings revolves around the year 1909 for a specific reason. In that year, during the week of January 16th to the 23rd, the whole state of New Jersey was terrorized by its strange inhabitant. As the week progressed, people were so terrified that nobody would venture outside, even in the daytime. Schools were closed as no children came to fill them. Factories shut down as no workers dared to come to work. Fierce German shepherd dogs were found completely mutilated, livestock dismembered, chickens and cats slaughtered. All around the gruesome corpses, strange, hoof-like tracks were found. Many brave men tried to follow the tracks, but they found that they stopped completely in the middle of a field or road, or started on a rooftop, etc, etc. Joseph Bonaparte, former king of Spain and the brother of Napoleon, was hunting in the area, when according to his report, he saw the Jersey Devil. This happened in 1816 and in 1839. Interestingly, a rather strange period of sightings happened in the early 1840s. Over a certain period of these days, large amounts of sheep and chickens were killed by an unknown creature. Many abnormal footprints were discovered and many witnesses reported hearing piercing screams. That's right, everybody. Napoleon Bonaparte's brother has seen this creature. Let's read a sighting from 1959, located in Bridgeton, New Jersey. I am relaying this true story as it relates to my experience with the Jersey Devil. I was born in California in April of 1955. When I was four years old, my family moved to Bridgeton, New Jersey. We rented a Cape Cod style house in Bridgeton. My sister and I shared a bedroom on the second floor and my brother occupied the other second floor bedroom. My parents' bedroom was on the first floor of the house. Behind the house was a marsh and my brother and sister and I would spend hours there. It was during the late summer of 1959 that I had an experience that has haunted me for the rest of my life. My sister and I had gone to bed when late in the evening I had to get up to go to the bathroom. When I got up, I disturbed my sister and she followed me to the bathroom off the central hallway. Upon returning to our room, we both stood frozen in the doorway. It seemed like we stood there for hours we were so frightened to move. I whispered to my sister, Do you see it? And she whispered back to me, Yes. Clinging to the sill of our second story window was a sight I should never forget. It had red eyes and scaly type skin and wings. Even at my young age, I sensed that this was something evil and terrible. It made no noise but kept staring at us through the window. I don't know how long we stood there frozen in terror, not daring to enter our room. As if this wasn't enough, another one of the creatures appeared briefly and then they both disappeared. I sensed that they flew away, rather than just vanished. My sister and I climbed back into my bed and clung to each other until morning. As soon as it was light, we ran downstairs to our parents' room and relayed what had happened in the night. My parents were very skeptical and attributed our fright to a bad nightmare. A year later, our family moved to Florida. The experience that my sister and I had faded from my memory until one day at my doctor's office. I happened to pick up an old copy of the Reader's Digest. I believe the digest was from sometime in the mid-70s, perhaps 1974, 1976, and it was a story on the Jersey Devil. I was astonished after reading the article. It was as if a long, missing puzzle piece had finally found its place. Until I had read that story, I had never even heard of the Jersey Devil. 
To this day, I honestly believe that what my sister and I saw on that summer night in 1959 was not one, but two Jersey Devils. My sister's memories of that night are still with her as well. Next, I'll bring you Kathy's sighting from Atlantic City, New Jersey. This happened in 1995 on December 2nd. On the morning of December 2nd, while driving home from Atlantic City, I saw the Jersey Devil. It was around 3.20 a.m., and my aunt and myself were around Bass River when I thought there was a deer in the road about 100 feet ahead. I slowed the car and continued. When we were within 50 feet, I realized the deer was not moving, so I continued to slow down. That was when my aunt asked why I was slowing down. I told her I thought there was a deer in the road and it wasn't moving. I continued and had to bring the car to a complete stop because there was this thing in front of the car and it wasn't moving. I didn't know what it was, but it looked like a kangaroo-shaped body. I asked my aunt what the fuck was that and she just didn't know. She just looked at me and said it looked like a kangaroo. All the way home I tried to figure out what the thing was. Every part of its body was different. It was all one color, sort of beige, covered with fine hair like cat fur. It was about 4 or 5 feet tall and very sad looking. I woke up at about 9 a.m. and was telling my husband what we saw. My daughter heard me from her bedroom and came running down the hall and asked me all kinds of questions to which I was answering yes. When she told me it was the Jersey Devil, I laughed because I always thought it was only folklore, but she wanted to know what it was then if it wasn't the Jersey Devil. I drew a picture of what I saw because she told me she would bring me a library book home with pictures and I didn't want to point out something and say yes, that is what I saw. So I drew what I saw the best I could. Sure enough, the next day she brought me home the book and there was the picture. I wasn't frightened by what I saw because I didn't know what it was. On Monday, December 3rd, I called the Bass River State Trooper Barracks, gave them my name because I didn't want him to think I was a crank call and told, and told the trooper on the phone what I saw. I asked if anyone else reported anything like that. He told me he didn't know what I was talking about. When I asked him if he knew of the Jersey Devil, he told me that they beat the Rangers 3-2. I told him I didn't think that was very funny. He hung up. I have been to Atlantic City at least 40 to 50 times since then, and I look for the Jersey Devil every time. I am beginning to think this is a -a once-in-a-lifetime happening. I will never forget this experience. I still look forward to the next time. Our next tale comes from a police officer. It happened on Route 9 near Smith Mill, New Jersey. This happened in August 1996. On the way back to our shore house in Beach Haven, New Jersey, from a night out in Atlantic City, me and a friend of mine, who are from Philadelphia, had pulled off the road to fix the flat on his Explorer. At the time, we were both police officers of Philly. We heard what appeared to sound like a large bird land. It rustled the branches and started to walk around. The footsteps were heavy and sounded almost human. My friend asked me, did you hear that? I said yes and looked into the tree line. We then heard steps coming toward us. I shined the flashlight into the trees and saw nothing. Being fearful, I went to the SUV and retrieved our 38 caliber revolvers and loaded them. I then kept watch with both revolvers while my friend continued hurriedly changing the tire. We heard more walking around in the tree line. The steps came closer, then began to seem like they were going away from us. I shined the flashlight into the tree line again, and there it was, walking away from us into the wooded area. It was about four and a half feet tall and had hair like a wild boar, coarse in texture. I told my friend to hurry up, and then I ran after it with both revolvers in hand. I run rather well, having been running track since I was a kid. But this thing was fast. It seemed to bound, not run or fly. I chased it for about 200 yards. When it turned around and made a weird noise at me, I stopped and watched it jump further into the woods. I went back to the SUV and we got in and hauled it out of there. We promised not to say anything to anyone due to our jobs. We weren't drunk and we were trained to pay attention to details. It was about four and a half feet tall. It had a grayish brown short coat with coarse textured hair like a boar. It had small front legs and long hind legs. It looked just like a wallaby or a small kangaroo. The noise was so weird though, but I swear it was like a little kangaroo or a wallaby. Our next sighting comes from Nick from Bayon, New Jersey. This happened in April of 2003. I was in my house watching TV and it was Friday and my dog started barking furiously. And then I heard a crash outside my house in the back where my garbage was. I made my way to the door, but before I made it, I grabbed the knife in fear of it being like a wild animal or a person, so I turned on my light outside and quickly ran out when I heard a sound like a whoosh in the sky. 
I looked up to see something with wings look down at me, and I ran full blast inside. When I was finally inside the house, everyone in the neighborhood, as well as me, said they heard a noise that was blood curdling. It sounded like a woman screaming at the top of her lungs times about ten. It was really dark because I was looking into a moonless sky, even with my light on, but what I did catch a glimpse of was that the monster had a long brown neck with a mouth like either a dog or a horse. I think more of a horse because it was larger than a dog's mouth. Its wings were shaped like a bat's. However, it was almost like a mix between a bird's and a bat's because the wings were skin. The body of the creature was almost too dark to see, but what I did see was that it had a large figure, either like a horse or something of great power. Our last sighting comes from Lori in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey. This happened in 2004. On the night of February 17th, early morning hours of February 18th, there was a beautiful snowstorm. We are night owls, and around 11 p.m., my three kids and I went out to play in the snow and take pictures with our digital camera. That went well, though we experienced the usual dread feeling that can come over us now and again in these woods. At 2.30 a.m., I noticed I had left some lights on in the backyard by my rabbit barn. My son and I went out to unplug the lights and enjoy the snow one last time. I was trying to unplug these lights when my son, who was standing in front of me, started pointing up in a tree and making struggling, terrified sounds but not speaking. I turned to look behind me and saw huge piles of snow falling from a shaking treetop. We were terrified and both started running for our back door. Halfway across, I stopped dead in my tracks as I realized that now this thing was in front of me on my rooftop. It had cleared approximately 85 feet from tree to roof in a matter of seconds. I was then horrified to hear this thing scuttling down the roof at me. We all reached the door at this time. This thing reached the edge of the roof and a mini avalanche of snow fell on our heads as it slid to a stop. We flew in the door and we were freaked out. I mentioned the incident to my semi-sleeping husband who dismissed it as a wives' tale. Of bumps to the night. The next morning, however, we were all shocked to see the prints, cloven hoof prints, clearly two-legged, perfectly preserved in the snow on our roof. Documenting my story exactly, the tracks coming down the roof were approximately three and a half feet apart. One could clearly see where it stopped at the edge of the roof, and then there were awful tracks spaced four feet apart, going along the length of the entire gutter and disappearing on the side of the roof. No tracks on the ground anywhere. My husband got our digital camera and carefully documented all these tracks. Police were called out and could not identify the tracks, but guessed it had to be the size of a bear and wondered if I keep guns for protection. Local and statewide fish and wildlife folks cannot identify them or insist that they are cougar tracks, which they clearly are not. The creature looked to be about four to six feet tall. The head is awful. It has two large eyes, an animal head or snout, a large bulbous forehead with what appears to be horns in the front. I'm now totally freaked out about living here. It should be noted that after this encounter that this family had, they called a research society dedicated to the Jersey Devil who went and also viewed the scene and the yard and the tracks. And they find that this encounter was quite legitimate in their opinion as researchers of the Jersey Devil. Well, Psycho Derps, I hope you enjoyed the tales that I brought you. And maybe if you're in the New Jersey area sometime, you can go looking for the creature and have an experience of your own. Happy Halloween, everyone. The following story took place in an upper-class town in Cairo, Egypt. This story has been translated from the local language, and some misspellings, some grammatical errors, and some misuse of the English language may occur. We hope you can deal with these and enjoy the story. Uncle Mukhtar is the most famous doorman in an upscale district of <coughs> town in Cairo, as well as a landlord for an off-use set of short-stay apartments for foreigners and travelers. One Saturday evening, Uncle Mukhtar sat at his post in front of the gate of a luxury apartment building where he worked. After a short time, a traveler from southern Egypt approached him. Just then, Uncle Mukhtar felt a sudden shiver run up his spine. There was a sharp crack of static in the air, and Uncle Mukhtar blurted out a greeting to the seemingly mute man. How can I be of service to you, sir? The man told him that he wanted to rent one of his apartments as he had been referred by the locals to Uncle Mukhtar. 
He immediately escorted the man to the ninth floor. He began to explain the situation of how one rents here, but the southerner did not even care to view the interior or hear the full explanation. He merely said, I'll take it, and gave the amount of $1,500 to Mokhtar. This would be key money that would allow him to rent out the apartment for one entire month. In the morning, the man came back to finish up some paperwork that closed out the deal, and once again, a strange sense of dread overtook Mokhtar. Nonetheless, the lease was a lease, and Mokhtar did his best to ignore the unsettling presence the man carried about him. Later that day, three women with the same southern features asked after the man and if he was present at the night floor. Mokhtar wearily nodded and pointed to its location. The women turned and proceeded to climb to the ninth floor where Mokhtar's tenant stayed. Mokhtar wondered what strange scheme the man might be running, as inviting over women who had made such a dangerous journey by themselves was quite odd behavior for any tenant. But he hadn't even gotten that deep into thought when three more women arrived and asked again for the man in the same manner. And then, minutes later, three more. This time, Mokhtar had to see for himself what could possibly be going on in his tenant's abode. Wild parties and liberal intimacy was forbidden in all parts, as this area in which the building had been built was extremely conservative and religious. Mokhtar feared his entire business would be shut down due to this man. That night, he snuck a look into the open blinds of the man's apartment. Inside, he could see very little as the man never turned on a single lamp or light. So strange, thought Mokhtar. Figuring the darkness would conceal him, he snuck a look over the edge of the window and peeked in slightly. There stood the nine women and the man, in the darkness, unmoving. Only the whites of their eyes and teeth were visible. Uncle Mokhtar panicked and jumped back. He attempted to enter the tenant's house from the entrance to check if everything was all right inside. The second he had gotten to the entrance, he was shocked once more. The door to the apartment was completely gone. Uncle Mokhtar didn't know what to make out of it. Was his mind playing tricks of him? Perhaps there was a good explanation as to why the door had been removed. Was it broken? He decided he had best wait till morning when things could be more clearly seen and thought out. He went over to his friend Ahmed, who sometimes helped him with security issues at the complex. Ahmed lived next door and would always help him when any kind of incident like this would break out. The two talked for a while, had a few drinks, and decided tomorrow morning they would wake early and head over together. Best to have two sets of eyes to confirm everything they witnessed. Mokhtar and Ahmed woke at dawn and had a restless slumber doused in nightmares. A heavy feeling of dread hung over the two, so they gathered ten more men before returning to the apartment. They came to the entrance once more, but this time, a little girl came to the doorless entrance. Again, they asked about the tenant who lived there. He's not home. And everyone is prohibited from entering this apartment in his absence. Those who do will die. Everyone was terrified. What had that little girl just said? Had she really said everyone who would die entered the apartment? It wasn't just that, it was the way she said it. It was the inexplicable terror that came over them when she spoke. Immediately, all 12 men left. They decided to wait and see the man enter or leave the apartment in the flesh by himself. He would be confronted them. Just as they were waiting, a black car pulled up in front of the building. Five women emptied out of the car and asked for the flat where the mysterious tenant lived again. At this point, Uncle Mokhtar had had enough and seen enough. At this point as well, everyone from the local village had gathered at his complex due to the news of a strange tenant who was vandalizing the good uncle's fine building. 
all of them decided to pick up a tool or a weapon in order to defend him or herself. Angrily, they marched up to the entrance of the apartment. Ahmed shouted for the man to come out, but no one answered. Instead, it was total silence. So this time, shouting began to erupt from the crowd. Violently, it got louder and louder, but yet again, no answer. That was it. The crowd was on edge. Tension pushed to the very limit. The anger of the raving group caused them to burst inside the apartment. But alas, there was nothing inside. Not the tenant, not the woman, no little girl, not even the furniture that belonged to Mokhtar. Nothing. The apartment had been stripped clean except for a large message that had been scrolled in some red waxy medium. Uncle Mokhtar walked up and attempted to read the strange message at the back of the apartment. He read it aloud for the crowd to hear and they waited in silence. It said, we apologize for the furnishings we have taken, but they are needed for our journey we could not have gotten there without them or you. To this day, no one has deciphered what exactly this message was supposed to mean or who the people who had done this were. No one saw them leave. No one saw anyone moving furniture. And strangest of all, no one has ever heard, met, or known of the tenant Mokhtar rented to. Mind you, this is a 100% true story, even to the point that the real Uncle Mokhtar has been interviewed on national news, told his story, asked for help, described the incident, and even all sources involved in this story have been researched by the reporters. I leave solutions up to you, the viewers. It's a dark and stormy night right now, and there's a typhoon outside. Rains are dripping heavily from the sky, like blood dripping heavily from the clouds. <laughs> the winds are howling, as if they are singing to me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Dark Philosophy. A place where madness and wisdom combine in deadly harmony. Evil comes in different shapes and sizes. Evil comes in many different varieties. Some forms of evil may look familiar. Some forms of evil might look alien. Some forms of evil might just be plain creepy. Evil is different to people to people. Culture to culture. But I know of one evil that is the greatest and deadliest of them all. This form of evil affects us all. Affects you and me. Affects people of all cultures, of all countries. And this form of evil affects gods, ghosts, and demons alike. No mortal or immortal is safe from this form of evil. What is this evil? <laughs> well, this evil is 
none other than fear itself. Fear transforms men into monsters. Fear transforms wisdom into insanity. Fear is the enemy of wisdom and truth. Fear eats you alive from within your mind and heart. If you let fear control you, then you become a demon yourself. If you let fear eat you whole, then you have lost yourself. Arm yourself, protect yourself against fear with wisdom, truth, and the power of will. And try to win. Otherwise fear will take you by surprise and poison and corrupt you from within. <laughs> What's up guys, I'm Unrested, and our next story is a little bit like this shop over here. It's called Satanic Territory. It's a really fucked up little satanic shop in the middle of Amemura that's downtown Osaka. High class, preppy clothes type area. And in the middle of it is this fucked up little satanic shop that has everything from actual human skulls for sale to body modification that includes the head donut, which you can go look up right now online what the fuck is a silicone head donut. Check it out, this is what the shop is famous for. Now, our next one deals with a web version of this story. Going through the web, looking at mainstream, common to the eye stuff, you might stumble upon something that you may consider a bit disturbing. What happens when you find one of these sites? What happens when you explore it? How deep does the darkness go? And can even the strongest stomach take it? Let's find out. Everybody knows that if you surf the web long enough, you'll see some pretty sick shit. This is especially true if you intentionally dwell into the dark underbelly of the internet. Now, I've seen quite a few things I don't care to admit, but one thing that I'll always remember is a site called normalpornfornormalpeople.com. The first strange thing about the site was that I didn't actually find it by looking for it. It was emailed to me by someone I didn't even know. The email was as follows. Hi there, found this site. It's very nice, thought you might like. Normal porn for normal people.com. Pass it on for the good of mankind. Pretty standard issued chain letter, I'd have to say, although the URL and the last remark really piqued my curiosity. I was having a very boring day when I got this, so I made sure my antivirus was working, and then I clicked on it. It was a very average, very generic looking site. It gave the impression that the creators just barely gave a shit about making it look professional. The author seemed to have a very tenuous grasp on English, and on the front page was a long, boring, incoherent rant that I don't even remember and haven't saved. The site had a strange tagline, which even today people haven't figured out the meaning of, which was Normal Porn for Normal People, a website dedicated to the eradication of abnormal sexuality. And from the sound of that, I wasn't sure whether I was here to watch porn or if I had stumbled onto some kind of eugenics program, but I was here now. And I was very, very curious to see what normal people get their rocks off to. So, I scrolled down through the rant and nothing. The page didn't seem to link anywhere else and I was about to leave when I noticed every word of the rant was in its own hyperlink. So I clicked one of them and was sent to a white page with a very long list of links in the form of normalpornfornormalpeople.com slash and then there was random letters. So I stopped for a minute and asked myself if I really wanted to waste God knows how much time clicking random links that will likely give me a virus that will rape my computer. I figured I'd just try it for maybe five minutes just to see if anything came up. 
I clicked on one of the links and was sent to another page. This page apparently had totally different URLs than the last one. I was really just about to say, fuck this. Then I clicked on the third link and a video download came up. It was called peanut.avi. It was a 30 minute video of a man and a woman and a dog in a kitchen. The woman would make a peanut butter sandwich and the man would set it down for the dog to eat. This was pretty much all that happened for 30 minutes. It was obvious that the cameraman had to stop filming and wait until the dog was ready to eat again, and the dog seemed rather sick by the end of it. I know what you're thinking, what the hell does that have to do with porn? I have no clue. I've seen a little over two dozen videos from this site, and the majority had no sexual activity at all. After watching peanut.avi, I went on a certain image board I frequent to play online and do a little show and tell. The image board thread got lots of people with nothing better to do than to dig through the site, and that is how I saw other videos. Most of those two dozen videos were very uneventful and consisted of people taking the camera and going into a room and doing nothing in it but having a desk and a few chairs. I mean literally nothing was on the walls or in terms of furniture nothing was in the room. The whole room had a very cold sterile feel to it. The conversations that they had in the videos were just idle banter about previous jobs, embarrassing childhood moments, etc etc. It was boring. I kept expecting some kind of discussion about the people who were filming or what the site was about, but of course, nothing. You would never know these people had anything to do with porn if you saw this out of context. I will say one more thing though. The people who appeared in these videos were all quite attractive. However, the other videos that actually did feature content, which I suppose could be called sexual, is where it got really weird. I'll give brief descriptions of the stranger videos. If you're really eaten up with curiosity, you can try to hunt them down on a torrent site. I completely, completely know these exist. LickedClean.avi A 10 minute video filmed by a hidden camera in which we see a repairman working on a washing machine for the first two minutes. When it's fixed, the repairman talks to the owner briefly and then leaves. The owner checks to make sure the repairman is gone and he begins to lick all over the top of the washing machine. This goes on for seven minutes. Jimbo.avi, a five minute video of an obese mime performing his act. It was actually pretty funny particularly the one part where he pretends to pull up a chair, then pretends that it breaks because of his weight. In the last 30 seconds of the video, the camera cuts to static briefly and then cuts back to the man sobbing quietly, still wearing the mime outfit and makeup. Maybe some kind of obscure fetish? Diana.avi four minute video in which the cameraman talks to a woman in a room different from the interview room. This room looks like one you'd find in a normal person's house. Exactly where they are is never specified, as Diana only talks about her violin playing. She obviously plays her violin, but she keeps getting distracted by something. I didn't notice this until someone on the image board thread pointed it out, but... If you look at the mirror in the background, you can see a fat man in a chicken mask masturbating. Jessica.avi Another 4 minute cameraman video, this time he's outside the house talking to another young woman. They talk about canoe rides, and then the camera zooms out to reveal the city streets behind them occasionally. The strange thing is no one so far has been able to identify where this street is. Guesses have ranged everywhere from Europe to Australia to the Philippines, but there's yet to be a match for the street shown in the video. Tongue Tied.avi 10 minute video. 
The first five minutes consist of an elderly woman making out with a mannequin. The video cuts out like it did in Jimbo.avi halfway through and the scene is now a group of mannequins huddled together in a circle around the camera. The lights have been dimmed and the elderly woman is nowhere to be seen. From this point on, there is no sound. Stumps.avi, five minute long video where a man with no legs is attempting to break dance on a DDR mat in what looks like the kitchen of peanut.avi, but this time it's much dirtier. There's radio music playing unseen in the background, but it stops at the four minute mark when the man collapses on the mat in exhaustion. He breathes heavily and pleads with someone off screen to please let him rest. This off screen person becomes terrifyingly enraged and yells at him, keep dancing, which he does. You can hear this off screen person beginning to scream once more as the video abruptly ends. Privacy.avi The woman from Diana.avi is masturbating on a mattress in the interview room while the man from Stumps.avi walks around on his hands while wearing some kind of strange goblin mask. The door in this room was always closed in other videos, but now it's open. In this video, the only light is in the room, and the hallway is dark. Near the end of the video, you can see an animal quickly run through the hallway. <sighs> and finally, the last video we uncovered. Brace yourself. Useless.avi. In this 18 minute video, a blonde woman from one of the previous interview videos is tied down to a mattress in the interview room. She attempts to scream, but her mouth is taped over. After seven minutes, a man in a black suit and a mask opens the door, but he does not enter. He holds the door open for an animal that was running in the hall in the previous video. It is revealed to be an adult chimpanzee. All of its hair has been shaved off and its entire body painted red. It seems to have been starved and abused and has several wounds along its shoulder and back. When the chimp enters the room, the masked man closes the door behind him. The chimpanzee sniffs for just a moment into the air, lifting his nose. It may be blind for all I know. It seems as though it couldn't use its eyes to see where it was. Finally, it notices the woman tied to the mattress. It goes into a frenzy, and it begins to maul her. The assault goes on for a grueling seven minutes until the woman finally dies. The chimp eats pieces of flesh from her corpse for the next four minutes until the video ends. The thread exploded with activity after this video was uncovered and people discussed it long into the night. When I came back to the image board the next day, I found that the thread was deleted. I tried to start another one and they banned me. I tried emailing the guy who sent me the chain letter through the site's URL and sent him five messages. Still, never got a response. I have tried to discuss this website on various places every time I get banned. The site itself was also deleted three days after useless.avi was uncovered. Likely because someone contacted the authorities after this one. The only proof that normal porn for normal people.com ever existed was a few screen caps people took and the videos from the site that people saved and uploaded on torrents, the most popular of which, useless.avi. It found its way onto a few gore sites. Wherever you upload them to, all of the videos from normal porn for normal people.com get deleted after a while. And so ends the very first episode of Psycho Dump. If anything you saw here today creeped you out, disturbed you, or possibly offended you, then we've done our job. Bringing you the world your parents warned you about. Until next time, Psycho Derps, this is motherfucking Psycho Dump.